Hello, everyone, and welcome to another ATRA uh, webinar. Today's presentation is sponsored by Seal After Market Products. This will be the last webinar for uh, this year in the Central Time Zone. Uh, we'll begin uh, some more webinars after January of next year. I want to thank Seal After Market Products for sponsoring these webinars, making them free to everyone as far as members and non-members. And we'd like to play you a short video that they've given us to uh, present some of their products. Seal Aftermarket Products engineers and manufactures Toledo Transkit, the most trusted and complete kits in the industry for 25 years. Toledo Transkit gives you more, more critical components, more OE components, like premium seals and gaskets, more design enhancement, patented components, and all the little extras you won't find elsewhere. With kits for over 250 different domestic and import applications, distributed globally. If you want the best ceiling transmission kit in the industry, ask for Toledo Transkit by name. Okay. If you have any questions or any comments at all about the webinars, uh, any suggestions, anything like that, just uh, send your emails to uh, webinars at atra.com. Obviously, if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to just go ahead and text them to me, and I'll try to answer them to the best of my knowledge. Every time I do these webinars, it seems that uh, some of the guys in the previous ones will ask questions and bring up material that uh, I hadn't found or hadn't run into. Uh, you may see some notes in here that uh, are not in your handout. Uh, you may see some slides that are not in your handout. If you'd like to, you can uh, you can see the screen should look something similar to this. Um, obviously, it would have the A6LF1 uh, slide showing. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little camera icon. If you click on that, it'll take a picture of that slide and actually put it right there on your desktop. So if you see anything in the webinar or if I happen to mention anything that's not in your handout, uh, you can just go ahead and do that. Uh, today's presentation, we're going to do the introduction of the A6LF1. This transmission is found in Hyundai's and Kia's as far back as 2009. Uh, some of the models that you see listed here are for the European market. Uh, we do these webinars also for some of the European guys. So this should be a, the most complete list of uh, vehicles that uh, use this transmission to this date. There's a lot of differences in uh, the gearboxes or the comparison of, of one model to the other. As you can see on the left, that's the A6LF1, 2, and 3. And then there's an A6MF1 uh, and 2. Now, the MF fits behind the, the, the MF1 fits behind the 2.0 and 2.4. The MF2 fits behind the 2.4 and 2.7. And as you can see, the three uh, LF models, what engines they sit behind. Now, there's actually a difference in the actual length of the transmission. Uh, one of the things you may not see in your handout, you can just make a mental note of it or take a snapshot, whatever you'd like. I found some uh, TSBs lately that uh, any of these transmissions under warranty, the OE does not approve of using aftermarket fluid or additives. So if you're using any kind of uh, fluid additive, a bottle of whatever color you want to use, uh, it won't, uh, the transmission won't be, won't be warrantied under OE. This is what I mean by the length, the actual length from the front to the rear of the transmission to actually different sizes. There's another model called the uh, ALSF61, and that's a little bit smaller. So I kind of use the letters as the L for large, M for medium, and then the S for the small case. Uh, I haven't found uh, any information so far in the S. I have had some core suppliers tell me that there are some smaller models out there. The ID tag is located right here at the top of the case. This is going to be really important when we order parts for this thing. We don't want to order the uh, wrong planets or anything like that that would cause any kind of ratio errors or any kind of uh, shift concerns. This is the fluid and drain and fill here. The drain plug is on the bottom of the case. It's just a regular drain plug made of metal. But what you see on the right is the fill plug. 
uh, which goes right there on that tube to, to fill the transmission. It's also the, uh, the vent. That plug is plastic, and the problem here is there's a 3-8 square hole in the top of it. Uh, your installer may want to take an air tool or some kind of power tool and zip that on or zip that back, uh, zip it on or off. Uh, it could damage this because the whole side cover, everything you see there is plastic. So make sure that they don't use any power tools on this. This also goes for the, um, the actual fill level check plug. Uh, this is also plastic. It's got two tabs on it, so it should be easy to turn on and off. Um, Again, this has a 3 8 square hole in it. Uh, the uh, installer may be tempted to use an air tool here. What you could possibly do if you had to is use like a palm rash if you just want to break it loose. It shouldn't be that tight. But as you can see in the next uh, slide, the next photo down, the plug only turns about three quarters of a turn before it actually comes out. So if somebody were to put an air ratchet on this thing, it would possibly damage the plug and of course we'd have to replace the whole side cover. Now when you're checking the fluid make sure you're using a capable scan tool that will tell you the uh, temperature of the transmission because it has to be filled with the temperatures that you see listed here. Either uh, 50 to 60 degrees centigrade or 122 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, total fill with the converter would be about 7.8 liters on the A6 LF1, uh, 2 and 3, and then on the A6 MF units, it would be 7.1 liters. Obviously, that unit's a little bit smaller. Now, there's some notes. I've, I've actually changed the note on this slide because I, I kind of like didn't I didn't like the way it was written. Uh, fluid contamination and the cool hose is bursting. Uh, what's happening with these vehicles is they're getting antifreeze in them, just like we've seen on other model vehicles. Um, if the hoses are reused, they'll actually, um, from the antifreeze, they'll actually may look fine when you rebuild it, but this would be a good time to change them. Uh, the antifreeze will cause the rubber to soften, and we've actually had the rubber cooler lines bursting, of course, under warranty. Now we have to repair the uh, burnt parts. On the side cover itself, the previous cover was steel. They used an ultra gray uh, sealant on there, and there's the part number listed. They have this new side cover that's plastic. It does have a tendency to warp, so a lot of guys are flat sanding the cover before reusing it. Uh, the gasket's not reusable, or it's not supposed to be reusable. Uh, whether you use the new one or the old gasket over, uh, Guys that are doing warranty work down in Australia and New Zealand, uh, they're still putting silicone with it because they've had issues with it leaking. This is the component ID and apply chart. As you can see, we have uh, two brake clutches. We have the 2.6 brake. Obviously, that clutch is named after what it's going to do. It'll be on in second and sixth. And then we have the lower burst brake that's going to be on all the time as you can see in the chart. It's on in park, reverse, and it's also in drive one. And we have three uh, driven clutches or driving clutches, and we have one sprag. Notice in the chart on the right in drive one, the low reverse uh, clutch is actually released between three to five miles per hour. So if you look just to the right of that, you'll see that the low sprag is holding in first gear. So they're actually going to release this clutch before making the one-two shift so there's no bind-up issues or clutch timing issues and just use the sprag to hold until it goes in the second, then the sprag will pre-wheel. So obviously, if I have a problem with that sprag and this thing goes up to about five miles an hour and it hasn't gone to second yet and it releases that low reverse clutch, I'm going to have a tremendous one-two flare. And I don't want you guys to be thinking that you may have a hydraulic issue, start checking pressures, only to find that you just have a bad sprag. There was eight solenoids used on this unit. Uh, two are normally low variable force solenoids. There's four normally high variable force solenoids. And then there's also two on and off um, 
normally low type solenoids. So obviously when the solenoids are on, they dump pressure. Uh, when the solenoids are on, they, they uh, control pressure. Now you notice the one only to the far right has got a red connector. This is the lockup that's normally low. Over here all the way to the left, that's the line pressure solenoid. That's normally high. Even though they have the same type of connector, the actual configuration, if you put them side by side, are a little bit different. The two on and off solenoids, you can swap these back and forth. The part numbers are the same. They work the same way. Now, you notice the three black variable force solenoids that are normally high. If we swap these around, it could cause shift concerns. You'll notice, even though they all have the same color connector, each one has a different part number. So they're actually adjusted at a certain flow rate at the manufacturer. This is the solenoid apply chart. As you can see here in first gear, we're going to actually turn the SSA solenoid off, as well as the overdrive variable force solenoid, and that's to dump that low reverse clutch uh, during that one two shift at about three to five miles an hour. Solenoid function, this is the shift solenoid A and B. These are the two on and off solenoids. They're normally low, so as you can see, when the solenoid is actually off, the valve inside the solenoid is actually up towards the connector. This is the exhaust port, so any feed coming in will just be dumped. So we actually can see here that if the solenoid is off, there's no pressure going to stay in that circuit. Obviously, we turn the solenoid on. The valve will move down. It'll actually block off the exhaust. And now the feed can, uh, in that circuit can build up to the pressure that it needs to. Now, the pressure that's normally found in uh, the circuit for this solenoid is about 71 to 72 PSI. These two solenoids both measure the same resistance, about 10 to 11 ohms. What you see here on the right, if you look into the snout, there's an actual, like, three little triangle-shaped pieces of metal made into one. That's the diaphragm spring. So if you actually click the solenoid on and off, you actually see that spring move back and forth. There is a screen there, but we can you know, blow some air in these, try to clean them out, uh, click them on and off, make sure there's no debris stuck in that area. This is the line pressure solenoid. Um, although it is a variable force, normally high type solenoid, it's a little bit different than the, uh, the other solenoid that uh, looks similar to it. Uh, this solenoid will have two plastic screens. Now, in the bottom, there's a square hole that you can actually see the end of the valve. So you could actually take a pick or a small scribe and, and push the valve back and forth, forth make sure it's free. We can take the screens off, clean them out, try to clean out this whole area. Now, when this solenoid is off, the valve is actually stroked down, so our exhaust is closed. Obviously, for line pressure, if we go to fail safe and turn the solenoid off, we're going to want to have high line anyways for fail safe. So with this uh, turned off, the feed will come in through this port here, and the pressure will obviously build up and rise. Once the solenoid is turned on, about 80 to uh, about 50 to 850 milliamps. The solenoid is being pulsed. It can now regulate the oil in the circuit through the exhaust port and try to keep that control pressure to about 2 pounds to 73 pounds in that circuit. All the variable force solenoids measure the same, about 5.1 ohms. This is the 3.5 reverse underdrive and the overdrive variable force solenoid. These are also normally high. Um, notice that I said, like I mentioned before, they all have different part numbers. So mark the, uh, the area where they came out and make sure they go back in the same location. These solenoids have a, a, a recessed area here, and this is for the actual uh, balance feed oil, so if the pressure comes through here, it'll feed to the small orifice to control balance feed on that valve to uh, keep that valve a lot more steady. They have brass screens. They're easy to take off. We can go ahead and clean that. There's no hole at the bottom, as you can see here. It's just a slot for adjustments, but there's four 
uh, peened areas so that the adjustment won't move. Now when this solenoid's off, the valve is stroke to the right. You can see the screen through the small hole here at the end. We have feed pressure that's going to go into uh, the pressure circuit. And then also with the exhaust block, we're going to have a high pressure. These are normally high when they're off. So obviously once we start to pulse them, we're going to have the same thing, 50 to 850 milliamps. The pulse width will obviously change time, and then the pressure in the circuits are uh, controlled the same way as you would with the line pressure solenoid. Um, as we uh, cycle the solenoid, you'll see that the feed is being regulated uh, through the actual control pressure area and also through the exhaust. So that's how they control the pressure on that circuit. This is the torque converter and the 2.6 brake variable core solenoid. These are normally low. Uh, these two solenoids are very similar. They, you can see that they look just like the other normally high. Um, when I was first trying to uh, figure out how these solenoids work, um, when I actually looked at them on the bench, it was kind of confusing because the configuration looked the same. It's just the way that the actual valve inside was when it was actually off. So you'll notice that when this solenoid is off, the valve is actually to the left. This is blocking off our feed oil coming in and allows any oil in that circuit to just dump to exhaust. Again, these solenoids work the same way as the others. The only thing is this one's going to work the opposite way as far as moving the valve. So we're going to move the valve to the right and regulate the pressure in the circuit to about 2 to 73 psi. And the uh, hertz, the milliamps, will be the same on this solenoid as you would see on the others, just a matter of the uh, timing in the hertz. Now, the inhibitor switch, I'd rather to note here, uh, the adjustment, these uh, bolt holes are actually slightly slotted, so you can actually move this. What you need to do is get the transmission in the neutral uh, detent, and then we're going to line this hole up, and we're going to put a bolt in here, and we're going to tighten these two down. Now, before you tighten this nut or the cable adjustment nut, they suggest to take a bolt that fits in there nice and snug, and uh, do the same thing here. Have the bolt in that alignment hole uh, before we tighten up the actual lever bolt or the bolt to the cable. Now, there's the pin ID that I put together for you here that you can actually go with your multimeter and go through all the ranges and check the voltages on these pins. Now, what you may see on a capable scan tool is this diagram here at the bottom right. Notice that when we're in park, the computer's looking for the voltage uh, on S1, no voltage on S2, and then S3 and S4 have voltage. During the time when the shift is actually moving from park to reverse, the voltage is going to change on one pin, and then when it's finally in reverse, another pin will also lose voltage. So you could actually have a code set if this is not uh, aligned correctly. Uh, you may actually have the code set only during the time that you're moving the shifter. So be aware that it's e it better to have a scan tool that's capable of reading these uh, uh, parameters to make it a little bit easier. Uh, one of the things you'll find is there's TSBs explaining how these uh, cables and the uh, sensor should be adjusted. There's also TSBs for codes being set for these uh, inhibitor switches or range sensors, whatever you want to call them. Uh, there's other uh, TSBs out there for reflexes for issues with these. Uh, like any vehicle that comes into your shop, especially if it's new, it always pays to go to all data or Mitchells or any source that you have and look up the TSBs that are out there on the uh, transmission you're about to work on. This is the internal harness. Uh, this is the ID mark, uh, num pins for the uh, actual connectors. So you have all the ID pins uh, identified for you. Uh, you have the resistance for the solenoids in there, uh, also the resistance for the temp sensor, 
and the input speed sensor and output speed sensor. So you can do all your checks right here at the case connector. Now to remove the valve body and this internal harness, we're going to have to remove this bracket. We pull it out of the way and then the actual harness connector we push down into the case. Now, once we push the harness down into the case, you can see that the connector is actually up in this area, and this is a ribbon harness. This is very similar to the A4 uh, CF2. That's also found in Hyundai's and Kia, that, that four-speed. Uh, we get a lot of solenoid codes with those, and that particular ribbon should be changed with every overhaul. The easiest way to remove this valve body <clears throat> that I find is to remove the rooster comb spring. Um, it gives you, it makes it a lot easier to put it back on and to take it off. So I like to remove that, and then I'll come down and I'll either unplug or unbolt the temp sensor and just let it swing out of the way. What you're going to find that in some uh, March of 2013 and later, the actual temp sensor is part of the ribbon and not sold separately. Now I can take the three bolts out for the harness itself and swing it out of the way. At that point, uh, all you need to do, excuse me, <clears throat> all you would need to do is remove the uh, yellow bolts. <clears throat> Now, um, this slide is not in your handout. I'm finding more and more calls lately about multiple solenoid and speed sensor codes. Now, the main cause is the same thing with the A4CF2. The internal harness of the ribbon is found to have issues just like the other model. Now, both of these transmissions are found in Kia and Hondas. Uh, there is a TSP that takes you step by step through replacing the actual ribbon. Another more important issue that I just ran into, there's 883,000 of these vehicles, uh, Sonatas from 2011 to 2014, that have a recall for the shift cable failing and not holding the vehicle in park or not allowing the vehicle to be shifted all the way to park. Uh, so you may shift one of these vehicles in the park and try to get out, and all of a sudden it starts rolling uh, because there's a problem with the actual cable and linkage. So keep that in mind if any of these uh, uh, 2011 to 2014 Sonatas come into your shop. So if anyone wants to take a snapshot of that slide, go, go right ahead. <clears throat> Now, if you do have the temp sensor that's not part of the harness, you have the information here in your handout <clears> that gives you the temperature in centigrade and Fahrenheit and the resistance that goes along with it. You have the pin ID and what the temperature will normally read on these. One of the things I want to uh, mention here is if this does go into fail safe because of this temp sensor, it should normally set a code, but there are times that it won't. It may not even turn on the mill light. What you'll end up having is you'll be stuck in fourth gear, or you'll have first and second gear being prohibited, and that could be caused by the temp sensor. So going in with a capable, uh, capable scan tool, or um, you could actually go right to the case connector and just check the, um, the, the resistance on the sensor. Now, if you see that the resistance is stuck at 176 on the scan tool, that would be a good time to go in and check and see what the sensor is reading with the multimeter. Because if this does go to fail safe, it will, uh, you'll see on the scan tool, it will just fix the temp sensor at a certain uh, degree, and that's it. Now, this, this is the input and output speed sensors. They are separate from the... Um, from the main harness, but they are integrated together in one harness. So if you replace one, you have to replace the other. Now, I have the pin IDs here for you. Uh, you'll notice that there's only one positive and one negative. There's usually nine volts sent to them from the TCM, uh, but they are actually Hall effect sensors. So they are two, two pin Hall effect sensors. Uh, you have the air gap 
that's needed between the sensor and the component that it's monitoring. Um, resistance on one is a little bit different than the other. You can see that the output speed sensor is about 5.8 milliohms and about 3.8 milliohms on the input speed sensor. This sensor will cause almost the same type of uh, failure symptom as the temp sensor. You'll notice that if it does fail safe, you will be in four pure cold. And if you try to do uh, drive, it'll, it, you may get drive two and drive four in the manual shift mode. Uh, again, sometimes these set lights, sometimes they don't. There are TSBs out there for the temp sensor, uh, issues with the temp sensor. There's uh, TSBs out there for uh, multiple sensor or solenoid codes. There's also several reflashes available for uh, setting any type of ratio codes. So before you go and just replace sensors, it's always good to look at the TSBs, see if your model falls in that category, and then just have it reflash and it may just fix the problem. There's actually another TSB out there that if a customer comes to you with one that they've driven for a long time, it's driven normally, they've noticed some uh, delayed harsh engagements, maybe delayed shifts or harsh shifts, uh, there's a TSB that tells you to go in and do the relearn procedure. Uh, before doing any repairs. Uh, if the relearn procedure doesn't help, there's also a reflex to help for those complaints. Uh, obviously, uh, if it, it's something that's just come, come up recently or if something that's gradually going there, then obviously they have a problem inside the transmission and it may be time to go inside and do some repairs. This is the location of the input and output speed sensors. As you can see, the one in the middle of the case here, this is the output speed sensor. This is the front of the case up to the left, and the rear of the case to the right. And in the middle of the case is the transfer gear. So the sensor is actually monitoring the teeth on the transfer gear itself, the drive gear. This is an all-wheel drive. It's a little bit different than what you would find on a two-wheel drive. Now, the one on the right is towards the back of the case. That's the input speed sensor. It's actually monitoring the lugs on the drum of the overdrive clutch drum. This drum is obviously turning all the time. There's a shaft that goes right through the middle of the transmission uh, all the way to the front. These are the case air checks. You have them all located in your handout. You want to do some uh, air checks here. Now, I probably mentioned this a thousand times. Uh, I would do MI air checks with 30 PSI of regulated air, not just using the uh, air that's coming off the compressor of the shot. This is the outer valve body assembly. There's actually three sections of the valve body. Uh, this is the section that you'd see first as soon as you remove the, uh, the side cover. There's known to have valve body wear problems on these transmissions as low as 35,000 miles. You have all these spring specifications in your handout. Now this is the side of the outer valve body. Uh, on the other side, we're looking at the, uh, the screens. There's five screens to go in here. And the rubber side of the screen should face up towards the separator plate. There will also be one damper valve that's made of plastic. And that's where the, uh, the short stout spring goes to. You have the spring dimension there. And then you have the smaller spring dimension that goes with the steel check valve. This is the center valve body assembly. You have all the valve IDs and the spring dimensions in your handout. Now this is the center valve body assembly. This is the side that faces towards the inside, uh, towards the inner valve body. You'll have uh, two check valves that are made of steel, same as the others. The spring dimensions are basically the same. So you'll have two uh, of these located in this side of the valve body. Okay, on the other side, the side that faces out towards the outer valve body, you have this square screen that should go back in the transmission. And also you will have a plastic damper valve here, and the spring dimension is the same as the others. This is the inner valve body that's uh, facing towards the center of the inside of the case. 
as you can see here, we have quite a few accumulators. Um, I've identified all the accumulators by the spring dimensions, and also you can see here there are some spring colors. Now, on the end of the springs where the color of the ink mark is may wash off, uh, but that's okay because with the spring dimensions that we have listed, uh, we know where the springs have to go back. Now, as I mentioned before, valve body wear as low as 35,000 miles. This would be a good time to actually look inside these boards and see if there's any wear from these steel accumulated pistons. One of the other things I want to mention is this valve right here, this number 11 valve. There's been several actual factory manuals that show the assembly incorrect. They'll show the valve first, then the spring. So they've actually had this incorrect on a factory manual. What you see here is the correct way that it that it goes into the valve body. It's the spring first, then the valve. Now this is the inner valve body, uh, the side that we're looking at with all the small parts. As you can see, we have four of the plastic damper valves here. We have three more uh, steel check valves. And then we also have one check ball. You have the dimension of the check ball and the dimension of the spring. Now at this time, you'd have to check with um, either Sonic, Superior, uh, Transgo, any of those companies that um, may have repairs for this. At the time of the print, I didn't know of any repairs for this valve on me at the time. I do know that all these companies are, are working on it at this time as far as making repairs for the valve body. Okay, clutch end plate checks. I put in this factory information because I wanted you to see how the factory goes about making this measurement for the 2.6 brake clutch. Uh, we're looking for about uh, 92 to 104 thousandths of play in here. Now this is a waved cushion plate. Uh, I'm showing it flat here because they actually want you to compress this whole clutch assembly. So you have to compress that and make a measurement from the top all the way to the top of the underdrive drum mechanic. That's where this step plate actually sits. So we'd have to measure from here to here, take that measurement, also measure from the, uh, the pump to the piston, Add these two measurements and obviously subtract it from the total measurement of where the pump uh, face matches the case all the way to the underdrive retainer. That would look sort of something like this. So we'd have to make all three of these measurements. And again, we'd have to uh, actually press it down uh, with the bar or something to flatten out the cushion plate. The only other alternative I'd, I'd like to mention here would be take this plate out and just measure the thickness of it and just go ahead and measure the rest of it and just add the thickness of the cushion plate uh, to your measurement. This is the way that I did it. I had this transmission. I thought it was kind of crazy to do this compression and try to make all these measurements. Uh, so basically what I did is I took an H gauge. I set it down on the case where the pump uh, mates the case. I set my metering rod right up on the top of the clutch pack. I actually took my cushion out and just measured the thickness of it and added it to this measurement. So we have uh, this is the alternative way of doing it. So now I just take it, flip it over, and now I can see what my uh, actual clutch clearance is for the 2.6 brake clutch. The rest of the clutch packs are pretty easy. We do have uh, selective snap rings for the 3.5 reverse and for the underdrive brake. You have all the part numbers for all the selective snap rings or shims or racers that go to the transmission. They should be in your handout. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward. We just measure from the snap ring uh, to the top pressure plate. The same thing with the underdrive clutch. This is the low reverse brake. This also has a cushion plate in it, so they're going to want you to compress this to make that measurement. You can probably do that uh, maybe with a, some type of a press at work that you can set the drum under there and do it that way or use the alternative method that I uh, mentioned before. 
And last but not least, the overdrive brake clutch here at the bottom, pretty straightforward. Uh, that has a selective uh, snap ring. You'll notice that the lower burst brake has a selective pressure plate. Uh, all the other clutch packs had selective snap rings. We have the part numbers for all these and the actual thickness of each part, uh, so you can figure out what one you need to buy to make your uh, make your adjustments correctly. This is the unit end plate at the front of the transmission. Again, I took my H cage out, stuck it there with the pump face matches the case. And I put my metering rod all the way down to the uh, inside pocket of the 3.5 reverse drum. Flipped it over. I have my selective washer here. Made my measurement. And obviously, I need to get this clearance of 221 uh, to 33 thousandths or 55, 0.55 to 0.85 millimeters. Uh, you have the selective washer uh, part numbers and thicknesses listed to you also in the handout. That takes us to the back of the case. Uh, this is the unit end play for this uh, section. Uh, there's two sides of the case where you have to load certain parts into the back up to that transfer gear, and then obviously everything loads up to the front of that transfer gear that you saw earlier. Uh, I took my age gauge out, had everything loaded in the case. I actually put the metering rod right there on the thrust bearing, flipped it over. I had my selective rate sitting inside the rear cover, made my measurement, and you have the chart for that also, for the selective uh, race for that. The lower reverse one-way clutch, this is looking at it from the back of the case. Uh, with everything assembled, the uh, frag assembly is going to be held in the case. So now we take the planetary assembly and we turn it counterclockwise. And then it should lock to the clock and turn counterclockwise. One of the general rules that you'll hear me mention a lot of time in different seminars or, or in, uh, webinars like this, I've always said that the ID mark on a part should always face up so that you can see it whenever you're putting that part into a transmission. Uh, this is not the rule in this particular case. This is the exception to that rule. The word front is actually placed on the sprag assembly here. So obviously we're loading this in from the back of the case. The word front has to go down uh, into the case facing towards the bell housing. This is the number one tech call and problem seen at the, uh, the uh, transmission shops that are doing OE work uh, for the uh, for the remands or for the dealerships. Uh, this underdrive brake piston wears out in this area here that you see. It becomes very rough. You'll find a groove in here. Now, this is almost the same issue we had with the early 99 Subarus with the 4EAT Phase 2 transmission. On those models, we had an issue with the, the outer wall being too rough, and we were told to take some uh, scotch bright or some emery cloth, some fine emery cloth, and make that smooth because it was wearing out the outside lift seal, and they changed it to a D-ring. Uh, this particular case a little bit different. You'll actually find the seal worn, or it could actually be torn. Uh, at that point, once you see any uh, marks here in this uh, drum, you have to replace the drum. It's it's not, you're not going to be able to sand that problem out of it. So that is probably the number one uh, failure on this transmission. I love the amount of pressure taps they put on this transmission. It makes it a lot easier to do diagnosis. Uh, what you see here at the top of the case is the low reverse. I kind of highlighted the, uh, the letters that are embossed right in the case. I try to highlight those uh, with a magic marker to make it easier to see. But you have one right here at the top of the case. On the front side of the case, you'll find four more. This is the actual uh, torque converter release and torque converter apply. So we can do some great checks here if we had some kind of uh, converter shutter or uh, slip issues. And then you also have the 3.5 reverse and the 2.6 brake clutch there. Now on the back of the case, you'll find the redu reducing pressure one and two. That has to do with line pressure. And then the overdrive clutch is actually in the side cover itself. 
And last but not least, at the bottom of the case is where you'll find the tap for the underdrive brake clutch. Now, pressure testing this with the uh, scan tool, you can actually monitor the solenoids because each solenoid controls the clutch just like you would find on a 604 or, the, or, or with the F4842 series that's found in Mitsubishi and Hyundai's. Uh, they all work very similar, and they use solenoids to control each clutch. So you can actually monitor the pressure on that clutch, and then also monitor the amperage on the solenoid to see if, if it's changing correctly. Uh, if the solenoid is commanding the pressure to work correctly, and you don't see the pressure correct on that tap, uh, obviously we've got a problem or a leak in the circuit, or we have some kind of an issue with the solenoid. Now, normally if the solenoid is sticking or giving you a problem, you'll see the amperage kind of dragging and not working correctly. It's not going to be a smooth signal. Uh, if you see that, most times that there's an issue actually with the solenoid. And there's just the pressure specs you would find on those circuits. If you have a scan tool that's capable of giving you the graphing mode that you see here, or you can use an oscilloscope, and you can monitor the solenoids and actually see the amperage changing on them. Uh, this is park and reverse. Uh, what I found interesting here is this is the actual waveform that you would see in drive first gear if we're uh, three to five miles per hour. Because remember, we're, we're going to have the clutch on until we hit that miles per hour. Then we get to drive first gear and we go over that. Uh, mile, uh, mileage, we're going to be actually seeing a big change in the solenoids because we're trying to get rid of that low reverse clutch. So in your handout, you have second, third gear also, fourth and fifth, and then sixth gear is located right here in the last uh, on the last page. Now, TCM learning procedure, I found it pretty easy on this transmission. Uh, whether you have the transmission completely replaced. If you replace the TCM itself, or even if you just had the TCM updated, we still have to go through the relearn procedure. Now, temperature is going to be the most important thing. We have to have it at operating temperature. And as you can see, the relearn procedure is pretty easy. They have a uh, procedure called stop learning. That's basically for the engagements. They just want you to shift from neutral to park four times while holding the brake pedal. The drive learning. We're just basically going to drive it through all the gears in the drive range and uh, try to keep your uh, throttle opening between 15 to 30 percent. You don't want to do any uh, heavy throttle openings. You don't want to do any kick downs at this point. Uh, you don't want to really get light throttle. We want to have sort of a medium throttle opening. Uh, once you've done all that, uh, take it for a ride again and do some down shifts from 6 to 5th and obviously all the way down from second to first. Uh, do this procedure four times each, and at that point the transmission is relearned and we're ready to deliver it. This is the all-wheel drive version I was telling you about earlier, as you can see here. Uh, when you look into this uh, area here with the shaft out, you'll find a rubber-coated metal plug. There'll be a small seal on this shaft and then a larger seal on the other shaft here. Uh, if you actually took this axle out, you would have no oil coming out of the, uh, the differential area. So this is where the transfer case would actually mount up, as you see here. So you can remove this without causing any leaks to the transmission. Now on the back side, it's a little bit different. We do have an O-ring on the inner part of this shaft for, for the actual, actual shaft itself, but we also do have a seal there. So if you do pull the shaft on that side, it will leak. This is what the transfer case looks like. It is serviceable separately. You have the type of oil that it takes, basically a 7590 weight. You have all the torque specs for tightening the drain plug and the fill plug. Uh, they suggest that you replace the uh, oil every 75,000 miles. And they want you to check it uh, now basically every 30 months to make sure that there's no problems with the oil becoming low. What I found unique about this transmission, especially with the all-wheel drives, is they used 
a uh, full opinion differential gear set. So you have two sets of spider gears instead of one. So that's something I found a little bit different. It's a lot more heavy duty. Um, you have all the specifications for backlash in your handout. And this is the back side of the differential, and there's that old ring that I had mentioned earlier. You have a four-wheel drive system on these. It's pretty similar to what you would find in the late model Camry uh, or the RAV4. Uh, you basically have a front-wheel drive transmission. This is the differential. It will come out to a transfer case that will send the drive shaft down to the rear differential, and you'll have a... Uh, electronic coupling module here. There'll be some clutches in here, and then we're going to actually have it's an electromagnetic clutch assembly. So you have some clutches and an armature that will actually control the amount of load on the clutches to uh, uh, to make this into a four-wheel drive. Now, in the auto mode, it'll pretty much work like a two-wheel drive, just like most of the Rav uh, Fords do. If there's any uh, excessive slip to the front wheels. Uh, the computer will start to change the current to the electromagnetic clutch assembly to allow the rear wheel to pick up traction. There's a lock mode also. Now, in the lock mode, it's used for climbing hills, obviously, or descending any hills or if any type of off-road conditions or, or snow conditions, things like that. Uh, the lock mode will automatically de de uh, actually deactivate 